The Hawkeyes get the spotlight here at the Voice of College Football each and every Tuesday at uh, 530 Eastern Time, 430 where it counts. They're in the homeland where Corey Bratta is uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm. And uh, settle in here, folks, for the next 60 minutes. If you're coming across our show, we do this for now 97 consecutive weeks. Thanks to Corey here at the Voice of College Football. Join Corey for uh, just about daily Hawkeye coverage of football, baseball, basketball, and uh, the happenings there from the athletic department. Corey, how you doing today? Good. And is this a good time, Mark, to tell everybody that uh, on our 100th show, everybody who logs in to watch is required to send us a $100 super chat. So that's a it's a requirement for So enjoy the next three weeks that are free. I'm, I'm totally joking for people. But <laughs> I like you're the idea. To do that if you want to celebrate the 100, 100 uh, show anniversary. We will have our lowest viewed show ever. <laughs> yeah, you just be you and me talking on a private stream. <laughs> well, that's okay. We do that sometimes anyway. It's called a phone call. All right. Uh, in this whirlwind of, of a new cycle uh, in our day and age, you know, last Thursday and Friday seem like eons ago, of course, but this is weighty, heavy, serious news. Uh, from the standpoint of the impact on the league, not that it's serious from a negative standpoint, of course, but from the 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 impact uh, on the Big Ten and Iowa in particular, of course, USC, UCLA 2024. How will the league be structured? How will the schedule be structured? Uh, we won't go through all the details, of course, for most of you. You've got this down at this point. I was actually very late to the party when it comes to actually uh, and then that's I'm not accustomed to being in that position but I took off on Thursday I got a few people to cover for me on the main channel on Friday to to handle the news and live stream and I was basically checked out of college football for the entire weekend and then I rushed back uh, and just made it back like five minutes before a live stream last night and carried that on through the rest of the night and I really haven't completely soaked in the schedule format uh, and have not produced anything on it personally. I do know that Iowa has those three permanent uh, protected rivals uh, that they had requested. And as I understand it, now that uh, Steve Dace hit me with it on the Michigan podcast uh, this afternoon, uh, both schools had to agree on that protected rivalry status. So Wisconsin, Minnesota and Nebraska uh, pinned with Iowa, and uh, we now know what the Big Ten schedule is going to look like. Not specific weeks, not specific times, but for the next two seasons, 24-25 for the Iowa Hawkeyes in particular. Just your thoughts about the Big Ten approach and what that looks like for the Hawkeyes. I've got so many thoughts on this. And by the way, before we get into the schedule, you alluded to your trip. It is nice, like regardless of what type of work you are a part of, isn't it nice to kind of get away? <laughs> I'm sure you probably oh, absolutely it is avoid kind of being behind for a little bit. So, you know, everybody looks at what you're doing and, well, you get to talk about sports every day. It is fun. We enjoy what we do here, but it is nice to have a reprieve as it relates to the schedule. And that was a, a big, big announcement that came back last week. And we knew that, you know, had kind of been anticipated for a while. The three built in uh, rivals that Iowa kept on the schedule moving forward. And by the way, the implication from the Big Ten is that those rivals will be kept beyond 2025. So that's the implication here. Even though we only got two schedules, the idea is those will be built into the schedules beyond because, Mark, every team has three built-in opponents for 24 and 25, whether they're rivals or not. They're just not guaranteed to be kept beyond 25. Um, so... You know, the only thing I said on my live show last week that I would repeat here is that I think I am to the point in my life and in my days of covering the sport the way I cover it and, and watching it as a fan the way I watch it, where I think I would like something a little bit different. I don't know what that would look like. Does that mean you get rid of Iowa State in the non-conference? Probably. If there's one to drop, I would probably drop ISU. Because I think it makes – you've talked about it being the most boring schedule in the country. That won't change in spite of the fact that you're adding USC and UCLA to the conference, Mark. You've already got four opponents that are built in every other – every year. You've got the exact same four opponents moving forward. We know you're going to get four opponents locked in 
regardless of the divisions being gone, plus you're going to have two cupcakes. So half of your season <laughs> is already known, right? It's already known. So that's my only criticism of it. Um, I think that the tradition and the history of Iowa, Minnesota, I cannot defend getting rid of that rivalry, especially with what it meant and how it got started. I mean, it's such a meaningful rivalry, meaningful trophy. Um, you know, Iowa, Wisconsin, I suppose you could make an, an argument, Mark, that Iowa, Wisconsin is one that Iowa should be willing to part with. And even though there's a trophy associated with it, like why isn't anybody, why did no one, I'm guessing Penn State maybe said, hey, we want to be built-in rivals with Rutgers, and Rutgers said, <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> I'm guessing that maybe happened, because how Penn State got zero built-in rivals is beyond me. And the only thing I can think of is that nobody wants to schedule competitive disadvantages. That's the only problem with this type of a scheduling format, leaving it up to these teams. And yes, they're requesting these things, but if you're looking at it from a competitive standpoint, having Wisconsin every year is probably not a great thing. Wouldn't you rather just have Minnesota and Nebraska? And maybe, hey, let's request Illinois, Mark. They're a border rivalry. Let's request them. So there's different things that go into this. I understand that. But uh, I, I would like to see something different in the schedule moving forward. And there was those couple of years where Iowa State was on the severe upswing with Matt Campbell. We'll see what they are this year. They were bad last year, as you know. I mean, he was one of the hottest names in the coaching carousel a couple years back. If they're bad again this year, I don't know what to think of that program. Um, big question marks there. And it sounds like they may have I – mean, we know they've got some of the same gambling stuff going on that Iowa does. And I've heard more scuttlebutt about personnel – here in Ames with Iowa State's program, like significant personnel that could be impacted as it relates to playing time than I have with Iowa. So all those things I just think about from a competitive standpoint, if you're, it, by the way, Mark, you're, this is the other thing we've, we realized from those announcements last week, we're staying at nine games. All right, that's the other part of this. That's the other reason, that's the other argument against keeping ISU on the schedule is because the Big Ten has decided, okay, we're keeping nine games in the schedule. Now, as an Iowa fan, you know you're never going to get non-conference games against anyone else, ever. At least for the foreseeable future, you're never going to get to play LSU in the non-con. You're never going to get to play Notre Dame or Florida or North Carolina State. No, it's not going to happen unless one of two things happens. The Big Ten reneges and says we're going back to eight games, which this was their opportunity to do that. If they were going to do it, they would have done it last week, I would think. Or you say... We're either taking a break from the Cyhawk series or we're giving it up. But but they're not scheduling two of their three non-cons against power five opponents. We know that. And, and I don't I'm not asking them to for the record. But I, I I think there was that thought, at least from my point of view, that hey, maybe they'll go back to eight games. And then if they do that, I don't mind Iowa State staying on the schedule because at least then you'll get to go schedule another power five opponent, even if it is an Arizona State or Arizona, Syracuse, Pitt, those teams that Iowa got in the early two thousands. Well, for one thing, I smirk when you bring up Iowa State because um, anytime you bring up Iowa State, it's typically, typically in a negative way. <laughs> and and I, I think of our buddy, can't think of his name, Levi. our buddy from Levi. SB Nation who comes on and you guys go into it. So I, I look forward to those uh, you notice usually, bi-yearly, biannual debates. What I just said, Mark, has nothing to do with me being a hater on Iowa State. I'm just acknowledging the facts. They were what? Were they four and eight or three or nine? I always forget. Four and eight. Were. They were four and eight last year. And yes, they beat Iowa. I'm not like it's not even a matter of oh, I don't want to lose to Iowa State. I don't care. They just lost to Iowa State. If they dropped it this year and Iowa State had had bragging rights for the next two decades, I wouldn't care. Let's get it off the schedule. Let's get something different on the schedule. I don't care about any of that anymore. It's not about that. It's nothing, no disrespect to Iowa State, but until they can prove that they can perennially be an eight to nine win team, Mark, why schedule? If you're Iowa, who is perennially an eight win team, wouldn't it make sense that you would want to year in and year out schedule on a fellow eight to nine win team in the non conference? Iowa State is not that. And maybe you make the argument that, well, part of the reason Iowa is an eight win team is because they don't schedule those types of teams in the non conference. You can make that argument. But I'm simply saying you don't see Wisconsin playing, you know, they're not, they're not locked in. Wisconsin doesn't have an in-state rival. That's a bad example, but I'm trying to think of a, of, of a good one. But Iowa's, Iowa's situation is fairly unique because they've been very stubborn with this rivalry. As Penn has State Pitt. 
Penn State Pitt. That's a fair one. That's that's a fair one. Yeah. Um, Pitt that was a great probably- rivalry for years. When I was growing up, they had to play. They did play. They played the last game of the season. They played on rivalry weekend. But Penn State joined the Big Ten. They had other priorities from a scheduling standpoint. And now they schedule Pitt occasionally. They did not play them for 15 years. And they go and play a national schedule against the likes of uh, West Virginia this year, last year, the last two years, Auburn. It's been USC. It's been other national brands. And I would be curious if you compared Pitt versus Iowa State last 10 to 15 years, which program will have performed better overall? I think it's probably pretty close. It's fairly close. It's Pitt, but it's fairly close. But isn't it ironic too, Mark? that when Iowa has had opportunities to schedule other teams, one of those teams has been Pitt. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Like I'm not, no disrespect to Pitt, but even when they had opportunities back in the day, when they were playing, you know, eight conference games, they were not going to schedule LSU and Notre Dame. But I do think times have changed and this would be different if they got rid of Iowa state. Now with nine conference games, they don't have that one opportunity. Just for the record, I have called Iowa's schedule the most boring in the big 10 because we know who they're going to play non-conference. I've called actually Iowa State's schedule the most boring in the country okay. because they play True. all the same teams in the Big 12. True. At least Iowa's Big 10 schedule varied because they would play different teams out of the East. Um, but is it fair to say that Iowa's schedule will still, moving forward, be the most boring in the Big 10? <laughs> I mean, yes. there's no question about it. Zero question about it. Now, in terms of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Nebraska, uh, I, again, give you the floor on that, and you've spoken your piece on the necessity of those rivalries. I have a certain opinion. I believe that they're all legitimate. I don't think that they're crucial, crucial to the hilt, but I think they're close, especially how would you order them? Minnesota, Nebraska, Wisconsin? It's such a hard, because every rivalry was built on something different and came during a different time period. Like Nebraska wasn't even really a I mean, I know there was, go back into the 20th century. It was a rivalry at, at times, but I mean, that was one of those things when they joined the big 10, you knew it was going to come and it was going to turn into a rivalry and the, the trophy was created, but it does not have the history that Iowa, Minnesota does. And again, the, some of the meaning behind that, that rivalry. And then Wisconsin, Iowa has been, I mean, those have been the two best teams in this division for the most part over the, uh, no disrespect to Northwestern, but for the most part, those have been the two big players in this division since divisions were formed. And they are, they're all border rivalries. So I, I don't know how to rate. I, I, that's a good question. But like I said, uh, looking at all the criteria, if I'm also weighing Iowa State in the mix, I'd put Iowa State probably at the bottom. Because Iowa. here's the thing about Iowa State, and I've said this to Levi when he's been on the show before. As a fan, here's how I've always looked at Iowa State anyways. It's one of those games you hate to lose, but it does you almost nothing to win. And I know people don't like hearing that. Now, when Iowa State goes 9-3 and three and Iowa wins, that gives them something. But like last year, they lost. They lost to a 4-8 and eight Iowa State team. It looks terrible. They lost to them at home. Had they beaten them, nobody would have cared. It was a 4-8 and eight team you beat at home. That's just, I mean, that's not being sour about Iowa State. That's just the reality of the situation. So, um, A 4-8 and eight team that went 1-8 in, in its conference. Yeah, their wins were Iowa, Southeast Missouri State. Uh, who'd they beat in the Big 12? Probably West Virginia. I'd have to look that up. <laughs> I... Probably. <laughs> Our We're friends at West Virginia. Virginia. Um, and I wonder who, the, who who was the other non-conference team that they played? It wasn't a Power uh, 5 team. It was not, no. Let's see, I, I, you tell me. The, the, the Big 12 it was, was not. If it's not a Power 5 team, I tend to... It, so they it, beat two, well, one crap F- FCS team, probably a group of five team, West Virginia and Iowa. So I'm just saying, like, that's where I'm at. At least Nebraska has the tradition, and you can at least envision a scenario where they get back. They've got a, a, a no disrespect to Matt Campbell, but, but Matt Rule is a big name. Whether it'll work out or not, we don't know. Um, Wisconsin is Wisconsin. PJ Fleck has built Minnesota into a consistent player. So you can, from a competitive standpoint, you can understand those moves. And uh, for those people that are out there saying, well, why are you even bringing up Iowa State? They're not part of the, the Big Ten scheduling format. 
but they are. They are, in essence, part of the scheduling format because the Big Ten kept this to nine games. They are the only, they are the only out-of-conference team that is going to be scheduled every year by a Big Ten conference team. So, yes, I get your point about them being part of the conference schedule or the scheduling format for Iowa. There is no other team in the conference or outside the conference like them there is no Big Ten team that is attached to any rivalry outside the Big Ten like they are. Well, now that USC is in the conference, USC, Notre Dame play every year. So that would be the exception. Yes. Uh, Penn State's not playing Pitt every year. That's what you said earlier? No. Nope. So better than I would. They okay. didn't play for 15 years until there recently. Here's where I stand on this in regards to, well, in regards to the competitive nature of the three designated teams, Minnesota, Nebraska, and Wisconsin. Very respectable. And we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but based on the current and most recent trajectory of these schools and their football programs, Nebraska aside, very respectable near the top, not the top of the league, but higher than mid range of the league, but obviously they didn't get pinned with USC or Ohio state or anyone like that. So they, they avoided any, uh, and obviously there is no connection there that they would play any of the upper echelon, but they got three difficult outs, three respectable programs that are mid to high mid tier. Now, do you agree with me on the, the theory of Penn state, why they don't have any, don't you think it's likely they probably requested someone like Rutgers? Why wouldn't you? Like, why would you not want Rutgers on your schedule every year? And they could legitimately do that. Yes. Because they're both in the East. They Correct. have a history. They used to Correct. play as independents. Yes. I guarantee you Rutgers. Maybe Maryland. Maybe they requested I, Maryland or Maryland did not request them. Who knows? My guess is Rutgers and or Maryland both said no to Penn State. That'd be my guess. I could be wrong. And again, the Big Ten is supposed to be take the thing about this, Mark, is the Big Ten is supposed to be looking at who these zero to three teams that are built into each team's schedule year after year. They're supposed to be taking that into account and then collectively uh, forming these schedules based on a number of criteria, one of which well, two of which really centers on competition, right? Yes. I mean, these schedules are supposed to be balanced in spite of the built in games. So in no way am I saying that Iowa is at a disadvantage because they have to play Wisconsin every year and Penn State doesn't have to play because Penn State's going to have to play somebody good. But uh, anyways, I, I to me, if, if you, there's just a no-brainer for Penn State to want Rutgers on the schedule of the year, if your Rutgers has consistently been the worst team in this conference since they joined. It's my guess that Penn State had nothing, didn't want anything to do with Ohio State. Maybe they did. Maybe they wanted to keep that kind of manufactured rivalry because of rankings, but they've lost that game 11 out of 12 years. So they're probably other, happy to see them go. What other candidates would there be for Penn state in the, in the conference? It's Rutgers and Maryland. Now one of the big tens manufactured rivalries that has not gone as well as Iowa and Nebraska and does not make nearly as much sense has been Penn state and Michigan state have played the last game of the season almost every year since Penn state joined the league. 30 years ago. And there is some type of can't recall what the rivalry or what the trophy is, but I don't consider it. And it obviously they did not consider it at least one of them worthy of continuing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, as I said last week, this is the year folks. And I had somebody, I had a couple of people rip me last week uh, on social media because I'm always finding a way to, what was the comment that somebody made? Something about how I, uh, it's not unfair to Iowa. Who are you to say it's unfair to Iowa? I've never said anything about these new schedules being unfair to Iowa. What I have said is that it's gotten a lot harder. It's going to be a lot harder to win Big Ten titles. They're not winning Big Ten titles as it is. They haven't won a Big Ten title in 19 years, Mark. So the fact of the matter is it's going to be even harder to win Big Ten titles. And it's going to be, a lot harder to get to the Big Ten championship game. I mean, that's that's where we're at. It's going to be really hard to win a Big Ten title this year. I mean, Ohio State, was it Josh Pate? Uh, I watched, again, I don't watch a lot of other people besides you, you, myself, and a couple of your contributors. But I watched a Josh Pate short the other day 
and he made an interesting point. I'd have to go back and watch this. I almost, maybe I sent it. Did I send it your way, Mark? About Ohio State? I may have. You did. I didn't watch it. Yeah. So I, I believe he was looking at mock drafts for the first and second rounds of okay. the 2024 NFL draft. And yeah. Ohio State has the most projected first or second round draft picks. And I think the last six years, the, the team that's had the most first round draft picks has won that previous national title every year. Yeah, they have a projected I, like I I'm correct on that. nine or 10 in the top 100 players in the country. So in they other words, better top end talent than Michigan. But anyway, this is not a Ohio State, Michigan show. I think that the Big Ten was masterful in putting this model together. They took some of my suggestions, not that they're listening to me. That's not what I'm saying. But I've been saying for 10 years, flex protects, flex rivalries. Um, so they they exactly did that. They did not stick with some type of 366 model. They reasoned that every school has a different number of rivalries. I've only been preaching that forever. And I'm a person that rips on schedules all over the place. I have trashed the SEC scheduling model. The ACC's is horrible. The Pac-12's is okay. It's fine. Uh, but I applaud this one. They had a lot of things working here. They had to deal with competitive balance, regards of equity, fair schedules, protecting rivalries. They had to deal with now with this conference stretching from coast to coast, travel issues, logistics in that sense. They did a I great somebody, job. I had somebody ask me after the announcement, well, how in the world is what happens if there's a snowstorm and USC can't get to Rutgers? Do people realize that like college basketball teams have been flying across the country for non-conference games in the winter for decades? Like this, I don't think that's a concern. I'm I mean, not saying it couldn't happen, but that is not a major concern, Mark. No, <laughs> Those not. are not the things that are, that are major obstacles in all of this. There's plenty of money for travel. The, the idea that we can't, or, you know, work around a potential early winter snowstorm in November is ridiculous. As, what's yeah. the difference between Iowa trying to fly out to Penn State? I mean, I know that doesn't happen a lot late in the year, but I, that's not a concern. Um, no. Great job by the Big Ten. I applaud the Big Ten. I, I think they, again, much like their television deal, their media rights deal, they took a page from the NFL. Where the NFL, as you will know, if you're a particular team, you play everyone within your division twice, and then you play every team in a division in the opposing conference, and that rotates. So there's a system there, there's a structure, but then the other half of the schedule is nuanced based on records and previous uh, seasons' performance. And rarely do you ever hear about a team, you know, having a great record because they played nobody in the NFL. Like, that doesn't happen. I mean, I look at last year, the Vikings, a lot of people pin them as kind of, um, you know, fakers, but they didn't win a lot of close games and they'd be a lot of good teams winning close games. So anyways, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a great move for the big 10 and your, your overall thoughts on Tony Petiti so far, he's kind of an, uh, he's certainly different than Kevin Warren, just in how he carries himself, but you're just your overall thoughts on what he's done thus far. I'm assuming you're pleased. I am pleased because this is a major deal right here. This is, um, Man, this this has so many components and this impacts so much. This impacts uh, how you deliver for your television partners, for your fans, um, delivers for in terms of trying to place as many teams in the playoffs as possible and trying to have the most valid championship. Now, the next thing that's to be released that has yet to be released tied with this is the tie-breaking system. So if there's an undefeated team in the Big Ten, but there's a three-way tie for second place between three one-loss teams, let's say, or two one-loss teams that did not play, how do and we determine will happen. the tiebreaker? Oh, it will happen. It will happen. The larger yeah. the conference, the more likelihood the teams don't play. And when you have, exactly, and when you have Penn State and Michigan, I'm assuming that Ohio State's going to be. I'm not. I know that's going to 
tick off some Michigan fans, but let's just assume Ohio State's in the championship game. Penn State and Michigan not playing, there's probably a chance that they end up both with one loss or two losses at the end of the year. And yeah, that'll be interesting to see when that gets announced. You have any predictions on when that will get announced? Well, you're taking off Michigan fans because I have to fight this battle every day. And I get I get their their argument. They think logically they are the favorite for the Big Ten. And I get it. I've argued their point. But Vegas and ESPN and others are telling us that Ohio State's the favorite. Talent, top end talent rankings based on what we just talked about would indicate that Ohio State's a favorite. Hmm. I am going to be up all hours and to the end of August trying to figure out who's going to win the Big Ten championship because I can make a strong argument on both sides. And I think Michigan's path is easier. They have less question marks. What are your thoughts on uh, USC, Iowa going to USC and UCLA coming to Iowa? No, I'm sorry. Do I have the schedule right? Let me look at this. Let me look at the schedule. I should not just talk out of my side. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, They go to USC the first year. I know that. I know. I mean, we, I know that. Uh, Let me not talk out of turn here. 24. Do they have this up on the? They do have it up on the Iowa website now. Okay, so uh, no, they do not. Why do they not have it on the Iowa website? By the way, they get Troy next year, Mark, in the non-conference. Illinois State and Troy to complement Iowa State. Your thoughts? Troy and who? Illinois State oh, to Illinois go along State. Iowa State. Yeah, well, my thoughts are similar to what they are every year <laughs> when it comes to Iowa's schedule. I, I just, I, and I know they're in a tough position because there are nine conference games where other conferences have played eight. And if they had that wiggle room of another non-conference game, maybe things would be different and they're locked into this rivalry. And even though you have the opinion that they should drop Iowa state or schedule them less frequently, I'm sure that that would cause a major uproar if they dropped Iowa state with who you could be fielding questions and, and doing, uh, call-in shows for hours if that would be upset about that pardon me Who, who's going to be upset about that you don't think iowa and iowa state fans would be upset i think iowa state oh. fans are upset about a lot of things um but i don't think there's a lot of iowa fans that are going to be crying over spilled milk because they want to play iowa state every year i don't think that's maybe i'm wrong on that i don't believe that that's a massive blow if that get, maybe i'm wrong on it maybe as people, indicated by a number that. of people in the chat you are correct they don't care i don't love the rivalry i think it's a really i'll say this i think it's a very healthy rivalry do i enjoy it sure does it get a little feisty sure but in the grand scheme of things grand scheme of the season football i i'm just to the point where i think with all the changes with the conferences and and scheduling and whatnot and the competitiveness of this conference has turned into I don't think it's doing you any favors and the the conference schedule has been doing Iowa favors. Can we acknowledge that? Sure. Since they made divisions East and West, the, uh, the the conference schedules have played to Iowa's advantage more times than not as they have for Wisconsin and Minnesota and the other West teams. But the point is they are no longer going to be doing that. Basically on a year in year out basis, I was going to have a gauntlet as will every other team. So why put this ridiculous game that doesn't help you in the non-conference? I just, I don't understand that unless we're just trying to pencil in wins, which has been an accusation for Kirk Ferentz and the staff for a long, long time. I don't think that's necessarily the, what the reason they've kept this rivalry on the series because they think it's an easy win. It's not an easy win. When is it ever an easy win, Mark? <laughs> they, I mean, they've won, they've dominated the series uh, for the most part, but very rarely do they have an mm-hmm. easy win against Iowa State. So, Corey, as you can see, they go to both USC and Ohio State. They play both USC and UCLA in 2024. Yes. UCLA at home, Ohio State on the road. I saw some Iowa fans were upset because, ah, why don't we go back to Iowa, Ohio State? We were just there last year. Nobody cares. This has nothing to do with last year. <laughs> it yes, nothing- it's a fresh start. It's, yeah, it's- Totally, they, yes, they, exactly. They were not looking in their rearview mirror when they were building the schedule saying, oh, well, so-and-so played last year or just a two-year, okay. But that's, no. a, I mean, look at that schedule, Mark. 
UCLA at home is not going to be any, but they went nine games last year. Yeah. Uh, this will be a year and a half into the fickle rain. They'll get Wisconsin at home. You go to Minnesota, to Ohio State. Uh, I mean, you get Wisconsin at USC, uh, Maryland. It's a, that's a gauntlet. Maybe we'll both raise our percentages on whether Kirk's going to move on after this season. I've, I stand by what I've said. I would not be shocked at all, but at the same time, I keep reflecting on how much money is left on the mm. table if he does that with his with his extension going through 2029. You're on record, and you will have your prediction, as will I, later this summer, uh, but that Iowa should win nine or ten games. Sure. What do you think they would do this season against this schedule? Great question. Great question. Um, I mean, if we're just spitballing, I'd say it's safe to say seven or eight. Yeah, I don't think you give up and say they would automatically lose at USC or I mean, automatically they, lose even at, at Ohio State. It's not an automatic loss. So let, let's let's just for the sake of this discussion, Mark, because it is June 13th and there's not a lot to talk about. Let's go to the top of the schedule and let's just work our way down. And we'll assume, we'll imagine that that this year's Iowa team is playing this schedule. We'll see game by game where we end up. So Illinois State's a win. Iowa State at home is a win. Troy should be a win at home. So you're 3-0, right? At Illinois this year, I would say win. Based I'll on, take a win there. Yes. Yeah, based on the credit. I think Maryland at home is win. That's five wins. Nebraska at home is a win. You're 6-0 and there, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> now, yes, they're probably 6-0. and I wouldn't be surprised if they – see, this is where my percentages start to weigh in, the odds for me. Like, let's say they're a 75 to 85% pick against Illinois, Maryland, Nebraska. Well, if you start one. to weigh those odds – Probably going to lose one. That they might trip up. But let's say 6-0. and 6 and 0 UCLA at home. I'll say that's a loss. UCLA won 9 games last year. It's a different brand of football. I mean, you can tell me a lot, whole lot more about the Bruins program than I can, but Well, they're going to have a young lost. young quarterback, that's for sure. Well, they've got obviously I, that will be after a, a series of tricky games for Iowa. So just looking at probabilities as well, I'll say US UCLA is a loss. I'll say Wisconsin at home is probably a loss. Um, at Minnesota, probably a win. Okay. Seven and two, correct? Yes. Yeah. Ohio State's a loss. Rutgers is a win. U at USC is a loss. There's seven and five. No, I think we're at eight and four. Or excuse me, you're right. Eight and four. Yeah. Eight and four. Okay. But I mean, you know, I think pretty highly of personnel on this year's team, despite some of the question marks. So, you know. If Cade moves on next year, it's just going to be a totally different experience. I think everybody realizes that recruiting is at a premium as it always has been, but it, that's only going to be exacerbated when the schedule changes. Yes. So your, your instincts were pretty spot on that nine and three or 10 and two probably, probably turns into eight and four against this schedule. Keith is really thinking that uh, this 24 schedule well, is going to bite Iowa. And again, he's I'm assuming Keith's looking at this from a projecting forward to what Iowa's 2024 roster will look like. So, sure. you know, we just picked this schedule based on the 23 roster. In 24, Cooper DeGene may be gone. Kate McNamara may, may be gone. Transfer portal, anybody could be gone, Mark. We, we have no idea. And they could bring guys in. It's hard to predict forward because of how delicate rosters are nowadays with college football. Um, I, I have been very hesitant because you and I have talked about this. I've been very hesitant to start throwing out records, but I'm getting to a point where I need to start making some predictions. Yeah, me too. Because I feel pretty strongly about these predictions and, you know, game by, I don't usually don't make game by game selections until we at least get to late August. I just don't like doing it because lots of things can happen in camp for one. Um, but man, I, I, I feel pretty strongly about where I've got Iowa right now, and I, I've used maybe very dang, dangerous language when I've said that you know, Iowa's the odds-on favorite to win the division. Most of the media and most of the talking heads don't believe that to be the, the case. Most people are picking Wisconsin. They are the early favorites, I think, according to most metrics or most analysts. 
Um, I've got Iowa winning the conference or the, the West division, at least as of right now, based on schedule, based on personnel. And, you know, I was just thinking about this earlier today, Mark, because I was talking, thinking to myself, what we're going to talk about in the show today. And I kind of stopped to reflect on the last 10 years of watching Iowa football. And I realize that when I look back at 2022, I don't know what I'm going to remember. Besides, it was an awful offense. Like, I don't, and, and, and I hope that some Iowa fans in the chat can understand where I'm coming from. And maybe you as an Ohio State fan and college football fan can understand it to a point, Mark. But this is how my sports brain works, all right? I think back to seasons, and I remember moments. I remember games, and I remember moments. I remember where I was when I watched these games. I remember plays, etc. I don't know what I'm going to remember from 2022. Because, like, I'm thinking back, okay, I know what happened. If you ask me, okay, what happened against Northwestern? What happened against Purdue? What happened against Iowa State? I'll tell you. But nothing was memorable to me. To me. I'm not saying that's the case for everybody else. But to me, I don't know what I'm going to retain from 2022. And it's very reminiscent of 2012. There was one moment in 2012, and I'll tell you what it was. You want to guess what it was? It wasn't the I mean, one good moment in 2012 that stands out that was a hoorah moment for Iowa football. And it was early in the year. You want to guess what it was? No. <laughs> at Michigan State, okay. Iowa wins in overtime at Michigan State in 2012. Okay. And that was before the slide occurred. But my point is, like, that's a good example of there's not much to remember. They went four and eight that year. They went what, seven and five this past year, and I still don't remember much. Yes. What I'm going to remember from this past season, and I would think this would be what you would think of first and foremost, is that they were on the cusp despite Illinois looking more impressive through much of the season and winning the game head to head, despite Minnesota jumping up at times and Purdue was obviously there all the way to the end and eventually won it because they were gift wrapped the division by the Hawkeyes that they were playing Nebraska at home. Correct. Yeah. At home against a Nebraska team that came in at three and eight, to win the division and go to the Big Ten Championship, and they blew it. There are plenty of pathetic moments. There are. And, and there were. here's the other thing. There were close games. Like, they won at Minnesota. Remember that game? And Mo Ibrahim runs all over Iowa, and they find a way to win. But I don't really remember much. <laughs> like well, what I remember I is late in that game, the last two times Minnesota had the ball, they drove inside the red zone. And turned it like over. they were going to turn it over. And and Jack Campbell was, uh, I mean, he made a lot of plays last year to save this this team. Uh, had home against Wisconsin, ugly game. Uh, they win at home against a team that normally you beat Wisconsin. That's going to be a memory as an Iowa uh, fan. All I remember is, I want to say Horny Brook, and then I want to say Stave. Who, who's the quarterback last year uh, that transferred? Uh, Graham Mertz. Mertz. All I remember is Graham Mertz couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. That's all I can remember. I don't know how Iowa won the game. I think Cooper DeGene had some heroics in that game. But that's very strange for me. I'm not saying I got a photographic memory, but usually there are a number of moments that stand out, especially less than a year removed. I'm guessing that the Nebraska game does not stand out to you because typically a championship that is within grasp, especially against an inferior opponent, and, and Vegas got that right in regards to that being a close game. I remember us coming into that game, and Iowa was only like a two-point favorite or something, and people were like, what? Um, because you did not feel good about the offensive performance and how this team arrived at that point in the season is where you didn't – you weren't like crushed, like, oh, we should have won a championship. <laughs> And you remember, I know you ripped me that week. You ripped me leading up to that game because I remember saying, I picked Nebraska, but then I remember saying after the game, hey, I warned everybody. And you said, well, you can't say that when you picked, when you, I picked Iowa, excuse me. I picked Iowa to win the yeah. game. And then after the game, I said, I did warn everybody. And I did. I did say after I made that selection, I would not be shocked if they lose. And I don't often say that. So I didn't have a great feeling heading into that game in general. But I will reflect on this, Mark. Nine to six. Iowa loses at Illinois nine to six. And if you go back and watch part of that post game show with myself and Coach Patterson, that was the first time I've ever come on this show or on the post game show and said, 
there were moments tonight where I just didn't care anymore. And that, I'll be honest, I'll be totally frank and transparent. That stuck with me the rest of the season. I'm not saying I didn't care. I watched every second of every game and we did hours of post-game coverage. And I'm no less of an Iowa fan now than I was before. But I think a lot of Iowa fans will understand what I'm saying when I say it meant less and less as the season went on. And so when it means less and less, you're going to remember less and less. Um, I think back to, and it's not just a matter of a good moment versus a bad moment, because I think back to 2015, Mark. What do you think stands out to me about 2015? What is the moment that w- that is a great spo- sports moment and yet pulls your heartstrings? What's, w- what's the game? Well, unfortunately, from my standpoint, what, what stands out to me about Iowa football in 2015, despite all the positives of racking up 12 consecutive wins, are the disappointments and the embarrassments of Christian McCaffrey. And then prior to that, LJ Scott, a touchdown and getting the ball over the goal line to win the big 10 championship. Yeah. For me, it's LJ Scott. And I see in the chat, our, our, our uh, user Bether to Smith, that's a memorable moment because they took the lead in the fourth quarter and you know, the, the stadium went absolutely haywire but that was the game. Like that's a great memory and a terrible memory for me as a sports fan. And I don't really have that from last year because like I said, as it, as we went on, we, Iowa starts the, the season three and four, the offense is clear. The offense was going nowhere. You're starting to wonder, okay, what needs to happen for Iowa to make changes? Remember we talked about that. Would it be, we even said that, would it be better for Iowa to lose because with that force Kirk's hand and what do you know, Mark, they went eight and five and Brian's still employed as the OC. Not saying I'm not saying we were right, but I'm not saying we were wrong either. So I'm not saying I ever was actively rooting against Iowa. Believe me, I'm not saying that. But when you're when you're playing the long game and you know what's coming, we'll, we'll see what this experiment. We'll see if the eight and five, like, were the two or three extra wins in 2022 worth it in the long run? Because if it meant an excuse or a way for Kirk to keep Brian on staff, a lot of fans would say. It was not worth it. I'd rather just have a five and seven on the the legacy of the program than an eight and five and have to endure more of this. Well, if you recall, we had a similar conversation a few months ago, and I framed it this way. How much of this fan base, just because of the feeling that you bring back home or have uh, seeing a win watching on television or going to the stadium, whatever the case might be eight times out of 12, let's say in a particular year is enough that versus having a situation in which, you know, the record may not be what you want it to be, but this, this coach, this program, whomever it may be, they are striving for championships. This is their goal. They're putting the versus one that it seems as though, as long as we go eight and four and our fans can feel good going back home uh, eight to nine times out of 12 each season, then that's good enough for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll go home and take the dog for a walk. Oh, shucks. We'll get him next time, Mark. (laughs) I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. And and believe me, I think you both, you and I would both admit there's so many things in life bigger than sports and sports should be kept in its place. But there's, I, I, I've never understood, and we don't need to go on to another one of my soapboxes, but I've never understood the mentality of, you know, seven to nine wins is, is good enough. Like, I don't get that. No. Um, you know, not having championship mentality at this level makes no sense to me. And it is just a game. But to take Literally. your point on that, these people, it's their profession, whether you start with Kirk and go on down the line, it's their profession So take your profession, my profession, anyone out there and what you do, don't you want to be the best at what you do? Number one, number two, it's a highly compensated profession. So to say we're okay with 67% success on the job and make your, what does Kirk make? What's he make five or 6 million a year? 7 million. I think when it's all sudden. So that's the, I get, I think it's a great point. And a fair question is, does, and I'm not talking about just Kirk, but all the coaches, is Kirk Ferentz paid 
regardless of what type of work he's taking part in, is he paid to strive? Is he paid enough to where he sh- should be expected to strive for greatness? I think seven million a year. <laughs> I don't care what you're doing. That should be enough where you're at least striving to be great. Yes. If you're striving to be great, Mark, at whatever you make a year, and Kirk Ferentz is, I'm not saying he's not, but I'm saying hypothetically, if he isn't at $7 million a year, then I think it's a problem. If you're an entertainer, you're a band, solo artist, whatever, and you are so good at what you do that you can pretty much mail it in. You and your group can all play your instruments well enough, practice, Yeah, get some practice in and you can perform, you can sing. You just have had it down for so long, but you make a ton of money and people are relatively satisfied with it. But you could be so much better if you really analyzed your show and what people, what could make the show better, what could make you better, what could make the band better. But you don't do that because... It's easy. Fans would like to think it's more than just a paycheck. And I'm not saying winning seven to nine games isn't fun. But what's more fun? Winning seven to nine games or winning 11 to 12 games, winning a couple trophies and getting the experience of a lifetime at a college football playoff. So I think a lot of fans, let's swing this the other way, Mark, for a second. A lot of fans are very encouraged by some of the moves that Kirk has made. And a lot of fans are convinced that, hey, Kirk has turned over a new leaf. This is no, the expectation is no longer seven to nine wins. Look what they've done in the transfer portal. They've gone after and gotten big time power five names. That's fair. That's fair. I'm not saying that, that I agree with that completely because I think there are a lot of other factors at play. One being they lost a lot of guys in the transfer portal. They didn't really have a choice. They had to pursue other guys. They lost guys to other power five teams and the Brian situation. I think also you could argue that had to have forced the hand of Kirk Ferentz to make some moves that maybe he wasn't extremely comfortable with in the beginning. So uh, I see it both ways, but as as anybody who's watched me and you on this show knows, I I think this team's got a chance to be really, really good this year and not just because of the schedule. Like, if, if a team wins eight games against the schedule of 2024, that's a pretty good team. That's a good team. Maybe not really, really good, but a pretty darn good team against that schedule. And if Iowa can win 10 to, you know, nine to at least 10, if they can win 10 games on the schedule this year, I would still say that's a very good team. Maybe not great, but a very good team. If they win 11 or 12, they have a chance to be great. I made the point on our Big Ten show last night when someone made a comment or question there in the chat that again to me, and we talked about it at the time that for a program at the status of Iowa to be a top 15 to 25 program in the country for the programs of Rutgers and Indiana, who are the very dredge of the big 10 who statistically terms of production and points had better offenses than Iowa for them with lower expectations by the big 10 in the nation. No one's cons- no one's really talking about, you know, you have to be a serious Indiana or Rutgers fan to be focused on them at all. Nobody pays any attention to what they're doing. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> that they're firing. They're making staff changes after outperforming Iowa offensively and not being nearly regarded as the same type of program. And for good reason that they still felt it necessary to make changes. You're telling me that nobody follows Rutgers football and Indiana football. I mean, outside of their fan base is what I said. Oh, okay. Outside their fan base. Okay. Yes. Well, that I guess that answers the big question I have for you. And that's why you don't have a, Rutgers channel. That must be the reason. <laughs> uh, anyways. Okay. So for whatever remaining time we want to take, which is very little, maybe we'll just cover a season or two. Corey and I talked about this last week uh, in terms of memories or lack thereof, I guess, for 2022. So if we go back to 2021 and we'll go back as many seasons as we'd like to get to, 
because there is no urgency here. So in 2021, for a team that reached the Big Ten championship game but struggled mightily on offense, what are the memories that you take away from 21? Iowa, Penn State, right? Three versus four in Kinnick. Um, the misdirection throw from Spencer Petrus to Nico Regani, or well, I guess at the time he was still being called Regani, Ragaini. Now, um, that is a moment that you remember. Whether people, Penn State fans specifically, want to blame that loss on Sean Clifford being knocked out, let's remember that Sean Clifford was knocked out because Jack Campbell got to the quarterback and laid a big hit on Sean Clifford. Um, and I know Don Patterson, I wasn't at that game. I was watching on television like a lot of people, but I know Don Patterson said he thinks it may have been as loud, if not louder, than Iowa-Michigan in 1985, which, of course, he was Don was part of that coaching staff in 85. So that was a big state, uh, a statement for him. Um, yeah, I mean, that that is probably the big moment. The Big Ten Championship game, stands out even though they were 10 and 2 with a dreadful offense they were in the Big 10 title game and you know the the uh, unsuccessful halfback to fullback throw i believe it was Gavin Williams to Monty Potabom you like Brian Ferentz and Kirk Ferentz trying something different but you think boy if there's going to you're going to throw to anybody probably not your halfback throwing to your fullback trying to make an over the shoulder catch in the end zone um so i i i those were probably the, the two big games, two big moments. Iowa State on the road was a fun one. I mean, Iowa State, that was the game. You know, I was out at game day, and, and we did some live streaming from around the stadium that morning. That was a fun day. And there's a lot of hype around that Iowa State team. That was a good Iowa State team. It was a Brock Purdy-led Iowa State team, and Iowa just took it to the Cyclones in that game, turning them over a number of times. Uh, Justin Jacobs strip sack, or actually it was a strip on uh, – David Montgomery, uh, no, it would be, would it have been um, the other kid, the, the Jet? Why can't I think of his name? Uh, running back. Why I'm am I just, yeah. I can't think of his name, but Brees it Hall. wasn't Montgomery. Brees Hall, right? Oh, Brees Hall. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it was Brees Hall. Uh, Justin Jacobs strips Brees Hall. Jack Campbell scoops it up for a touchdown. There were a couple of Matt Hankins interceptions, I believe, in that game, at least one or two. Seth Benson, I think, had a pick as well, or at least a deflection that turned into a pick. So the point is, there were a number of moments in 21, despite the dreadful offense. They went 10-2, and and then they go to the bowl game. The bowl game was not memorable for me at all. I mean, that was a – neither of these last – I don't even remember. What happened in this last bowl game? Oh, yeah, it was 21-0, and the defense scored two-thirds of those points. I do remember what happened in last year's Music City Bowl. But the bowl games have not been memorable for me. Hmm. Um do we want to go back to 2020? 2020 sure. was a memorable experience, Mark. You start 0-2. In fact, I watched back highlights the other day of Iowa-Michigan State because Iowa will be playing Michigan State this year for the first time since 2020. And do you remember what happened in that 2020 game? Well, they the killed after, Michigan State. It was the week after Michigan State beat Michigan. And there was a lot of hype around Rocky Lombardi and that Spartan team with Mel Tucker at the helm. Iowa made, I don't know, what was going on with Rocky Lombardi. Of course, he ended up going to Northern Illinois and Sayonara to East Lansing. Des Moines kid, by the way, Mark. Uh, very strange game for him, and you feel bad for him. It was an empty Kinnick Stadium, but you feel bad for him coming back home and, and having a game like that. Uh, Charlie Jones had a couple of terrific punt returns. That was kind of his coming out party. He had a punt return for a touchdown in that game. Some bad special teams play. I believe at least one missed field goal and a couple really horrendous punts for Michigan State. And yeah, that was a route. Uh, and that was when I was Iowa was 0-2 at that point. And people were pushing the panic button. There's no question about it. Remember, they'd blown, what was it, a 21, 24 nothing lead, something like that, against uh, Northwestern the week prior? They threw the ball like 51 times. 17, something like yeah. that. Yeah. 17 0. Three possession game. Uh, that's hard to do, by the way, especially against Northwestern, but they did it. Um, you know, lost in, in Petrus's uh, debut against Purdue. They were down on. Campbell and Benson were both out in that game. But, uh, yeah, a lot of memories in 2020. They rattle off six straight wins. They beat Penn State uh, on the road and uh, end up having Michigan bow out before they could get to uh, that game. And then Missouri bowed out of the Music City Bowl that year. And if only we had known, when they blew that 17 nothing lead against Northwestern, that lost opportunity to go to the Big Ten Championship game because that was the tiebreaker against Northwestern. You could argue 
that Iowa should have been in each of the last three Big Ten championship games. Think about that. And in 2019, they went 10 and 2, right? 10 and 2. Or no, excuse me, 9, nine and 3. 9 and 3. 9 and 3. 10 and 3 with a bowl win. 10 and yeah. 3 with a bowl. So, uh, yeah. And then, of course, I would say 2019, if we're going to go back to 2019, the USC game is memorable. Um, you don't often see, I know that was the narrative on Fox after that game. You don't often see any Big Ten team, let alone an Iowa team, making USC look slow. But Amir Smith Marset had a big game in that one, and I believe that was the last game in Qualcomm Stadium before it was taken down. I think it's gone, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> um. So it was the last Holiday Bowl as we knew it. So without remembering, I believe the Wisconsin game was the game that determined that they stayed home for the Big Ten championship game because Wisconsin played Ohio State in the Big Ten title game that year. And I believe 2019... Wisconsin, boy, see, now this is when my my memory gets a little fuzzy. That would have been, let me think about that. Yeah, 2019 would have been, um, yeah, the game at Wisconsin, Tyrone Tracy had the 82-yard touchdown late, and I, I believe Nate Stanley tried to score on a two-point conversion, and someone got blocked. I think it was Makai Sargent got blocked by the ref. He was trying to lay a block and he couldn't get through the official and Stanley on a QB draw couldn't get in the end zone for a two point conversion. I believe that's the the game that we're referring to in 2019. 24, 22. Yep. Yep. Two point conversion. And then of course, 2018 was another loss to, uh, to uh, Wisconsin. That one was a painful one because you had the tandem of Hawkinson and Fant and uh, some pretty impressive plays through the air from, from Nate Stanley to both of those guys in that game found a way to lose. And that was really, it was that game that led Iowa to changing up the four, three and not being as stubborn about defensive formations in critical moments, because I can't remember who it was, but Alex Hornibrook threw to someone and left. uh, I believe it would have been Nick Neiman stranded on an Island and they scored a touchdown in that one. And Iowa began after that game, they began to go more with the four, two, five, the cash um, system uh, so that was kind of a big moment in 2018. The the Iowa Penn State game. That's that's probably the biggest game that stands out for me because as weird as that game was, you had I don't know if you recall this mark. I believe there were two safeties uh, for Penn State. One was a, a <laughs> I believe one was a bad snap on a punt, and it was blocked out of bounds into the back of the end zone. And the other one was just a snap over the guy's head straight into the back of the end zone. And I remember who was the ESPN guy. Um, man, I can't think of the guy's name, but uh, long time Levy, Steve Levy. Yeah, I just remember his his voice on both of those. He was just completely dumbfounded because it was just odd, and it was also a rainy game. That was when Nate Stanley got his thumb banged up, and they almost come back and win if it wasn't for a, a dumb interception down near yeah. the goal line. I remember that game. Sure. Oh so, yeah, I mean. See, this isn't hard to rattle off great memories or at least big memories from each of these seasons. And then 2017, Mark, boy, where do you start? Ohio State, um, the the exact opposite of Ohio State, the very next week at Wisconsin, you have two Josh Jackson pick sixes. That would mark five interceptions for Jackson in two weeks against two of the best programs in the conference. And yet Iowa can't do anything offensively, and they lose that game, which basically lost them the Big Ten title in 2017. And, of course, they finished that season off with the game on ice. Uh, the pinstripe bowl against Boston College. And that which was would the, have been, Iowa, Iowa, Iowa State, 44-41. Which would have been interesting that particular season because they would have rematched Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship game. I don't know that it would have been a, a fun experience if they had rematched Ohio State in that championship game, but it would have been interesting. I'll give you that. We've taken you back to 2017, everyone. So we can do this from time to time. Corey Bradda from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Corey, what do you have working on your platform this week? Well, we've got, um, I won't spoil who, we've got at least one athlete coming on uh, here in the next week or two, um, I believe from the 23 class. So a kid who just got to campus, he'll be jumping on the, the podcast, we'll continue to drop some recruiting videos. Um, I've had some people reach out and say, hey, why haven't you done videos on you know, Will Nolan? Uh, why haven't you done videos on a uh, video on Xavier Williams? I did just publish a video on Xavier yesterday. Just as you know, Mark, things come up and you have different 
news items that take priority and I have missed a few recruiting evals, if you will. And so I'm getting to those and um, a few guys that I have not published official evaluations for in the 23 class. And I thought, you know, this is a good time to do that because a lot of these guys are reporting like right now, last couple of days, they're getting to campus. And how about the number? If I asked you right now, Mark, I bet you won't get this. If I asked you this right now, who's the number one recruit in Iowa's 23 class? What would you say? It's not K. Obviously, Caden Proctor would have been easy had he stayed committed. You know, there would have been you would have been able to get that in two seconds. But who's the top? We'll say according to two four seven sports, who's the number one prospect? I have no idea. I, I believe I checked this yesterday. According to two four seven sports, it's Ben Keeter, the Iowa State linebacker yeah. who's a stud wrestler. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a guy that I, I, I don't believe I've ever actually evaluated. I've never had a conversation. I would love to have Ben on the show. Uh, so if anybody knows Ben, he's watching reach out to me. Um, and then uh, a couple other guys, Kamari Moulton is a guy that uh, would love to have on the show. So I'm just kind of trying to make sure that we're not missing anything. This is a, a time of year, Mark, where you're trying to, what's the word, uh, patch up uh, holes. And uh, what's the term I'm looking at? Something about loose ends. Tie up loose ends. Tie up loose ends. I'm trying to tie, tie those up, up loose ends, yes. Mark. So it's a good time of year to do that. And once we hit July, we'll have big 10 media days and then we're full thrust. Absolutely. We are. And I am trying to do just that as well. Getting back from a lot of time off and uh, a lot of content ideas that we want to go forward with. May was great debate month at the boys of college football, but much like promotional campaigns, we just may was the, the surge and then we'll just continue it on. So folks, if you have a Iowa related debate that you would like us to take on, we will. Uh, We have taken on four great debates. We've got a few looming here very soon. I believe sometime this late week or into the weekend, we will take on Michigan, Nebraska, 1997 National Championship, Ohio State's Fiesta Bowl win to win the National Championship against uh, Miami, very controversial, and then the Michigan-Ohio State controversy in 2016 with the spot of the ball and Ohio state's win. Those are three that are upcoming soon. We have fun with our great debates. Some of them we need to take uh, behind the paywall because of video situations, but, uh, and, and video, we want to review the game and watch the game. Uh, Others we don't. So the next one, Michigan, Nebraska, we will have that displayed on the Michigan and Nebraska shows uh, and channels for everyone to see. All right, Corey, speaking of which, uh, with Nebraska, of course, we've got them coming up here in 20 or 25 minutes. So check us out, Nebraska Live at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 Central. You got our friend from Corn Nation coming over? I don't know if John's going to join us tonight. He has the link. He has the invite. And uh, John is welcome to join us at any time. Our buddy John from Corn Nation. Greg will be there from Husker Online as well. All right, Corey, have a great rest of your week. Appreciate you being here as we uh, steamroll toward 100 shows and uh, get everyone set for Iowa training camp coming up in August. Sounds good, Mark. Thanks.